Well, hello, ALBW, wherever you are. And before I get started, just let me say how absolutely fantastic it was to see so many of you in Halifax this past weekend during the Ann Lister uh, Memorial Weekend. And um, without going in too much into detail on that one, let me just say that if that energy that was going on in Halifax this weekend with just 25 to 50 of you is any indication, ALBW in person in April is going to be something none of us will ever forget. So please come. Now, in the meantime, today, I'm really happy to say that we are, uh, we're going to be bringing in um, Janet Lee, the author of The Gentleman Jack Effect, Lessons in Breaking Rules and Living Out Loud. Janet, come on in. Hi, everybody. How are you? I'm great. Yeah, it's great. Glad to be here. It was a great weekend, wasn't it? Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah. Janet was... Uh, Janet got lots of love in Halifax. She shared a stage with uh, Jill Liddington and Helena Whitbread talking about the Gentleman Jack effect. Uh, we had a lovely little launch of her book at the Peace Hall with Nikki Chance uh, Thompson, who's the CEO of the Peace Hall, and uh, sold uh, several books and lots of autographs and really a great time. Um, and the other thing is today, uh, what you're going to be seeing a little, it's a little bit different. We actually um, taped this interview at the Halifax Minster, uh, which both of us thought would be incredibly important um, based on the content of Janet's book. So we're going to be going into a, a video here in a couple of seconds, but we'll come back and we'll have plenty of time for um, live questions and answers. Janet, did you want to add anything before we throw this over to Steph? You know, it was a fantastic experience to be in Halifax, and and Pat's absolutely right. When we all gather there in a few months, it if you're not planning on coming, change your mind, and you 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 don't want to miss this. This is going to be awesome. Yeah, really awesome. So with that, Steph, take it away. Hi, everybody. Lovely to see you all and welcome to the Minster. A very special place. A very special place and a very special backdrop. A very special Just today. Backdrop. Yes. Um, for those of you who may not be able to see this, this is Ann Lister's ledger stone behind us. So, Reverend Finn, you've had the opportunity to see up close the transformational power of Gentleman Jack. Yeah, absolutely. It's been... It's just been such an incredible couple of years, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, and the amount of women that have come into this place and that I've had conversations with in the last couple of years, is, it's just been mind-blowing, yeah. absolutely mind-blowing. People have just started coming and they just haven't stopped. Mm -hmm. And I think to start with, it was really surprising yeah. that so many were coming within probably a couple of days of the first airing. Um, and then they just, it didn't stop. Right. There doesn't seem to be like a finite number of new women that I meet. Right. Um, and the other surprising thing is that it's just carrying on. Yes. There's no stop. And the amount um, of new friends and women that I've met in the last week as well, but so much has changed for so many people. They, people have come searching. I don't think they've realized they've come searching. Right. But they've come searching for identity. They've come searching for belonging to something. Um, they're looking they for their community. They're looking for their community, yeah. which is the thing that, that you ace at. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that they realise that that's... They just were coming visiting. Yeah. They were coming to Shibden Hall. They were coming to the Minster, the Peace Hall, coming to see this amazing stone. Right. Um, but I don't think, and, and they've started to unpick what it is they're coming for. Right. And within that, there's just been massive transformation in so many people. And it's been such a delight and such a privilege to be part of it. Well, we have been privileged to have you here to do that. And I know you've heard me say it a million times. I don't know what we're going to do without you. <laughs> I hate the thought of Jane Finn at the Minster just being a moment in time. So, but thank you. 
from the bottom Very of all of our hearts. Welcome. It's been an absolute joy and an absolute pleasure. Thank you. So we are here today to talk to Janet Lee, the author of The Gentleman Jack Effect, and we're going to bring her on right now to talk about what happened mm -hmm. after all this transformation. Well, through the magic of video, <laughs> we now have Janet Lee, the author of The Gentleman Jack Effect. Janet, it has been one heck of a weekend here, hasn't it? Amen, sister. Amen, sister. <laughs> it was so delightful to see you get a chance to actually launch your book here in Halifax, where all of this started with Ann Lister and has continued through with the transformation brought by Gentleman Jack. You know, I couldn't have asked for a better place to uh, launch a book about what Gentleman Jack and mm -hmm. Halifax has meant for so many of us. Exactly. It's just a, it, it, it's a phenomenal place to be, and it's... I know everybody's heard me say this a million times, but it's so much different being here with your community. And this weekend was a really great example of that. It was really a magical moment yesterday at the Peace Hall when the Ann Lister st statue was unveiled. And I think it's the first time many of us have all been together. It was a small number, but there was so much energy and so much joy and so much love circulating in that group. Mm -hmm. And I think if Gentleman Jack has done anything. It's produced that community and that sense of belonging that I think many of us have missed for a really long time. For a really long time. And before we move forward, I think it would be appropriate for us to thank both Sally Wainwright and, and uh, Saran Jones for being so unbelievably generous with their time yesterday. They absolutely were. Watching Saran Jones work the line as if she were a politician was amazing, but she was so kind, she was so willing to stop and talk to people and pose for selfies and yeah. sign whatever anybody put in under her nose. She, right. she was delightful. To and just Sally was the same. She, they yeah. were just, I still think they are a bit in awe of what they've created. I think so too. Yeah, I'm not sure they're, <laughs> I'm not sure they were prepared. So the Gentleman Jack effect, how did you come up with that name? What was your process there? Well, it seemed pretty obvious. I mean, the Gentleman Jack effect is about the impact that a television show has had on its audience and about the changes that it's fostered. And it just seemed like the logical way to describe it. I mean, we don't really expect television to have that sort of power. Right. We know we have television that educates, informs, uh, but rarely does it inspire the kind of changes that this eight hours of television has wrought. Right. It has been absolutely amazing. So what was your process once you decided to do this book? What was your process? There was, there was the lead up to the book. When I watched the show, like many people, I was just dazzled by the representation of a lesbian in a starring role in a positive manner. i would never seen it before, and I'm not exactly a spring chicken, <laughs> as Marion would say. And so when I was, I was reacting to this, I was watching the show over and over, but the first thing I did, which apparently many women did, was I wanted to find out who Ann Lister was because I'd never heard of this woman. Right, yeah. And so there wasn't much available at the time, so I was just desperate to find information. And I saw on social media that this was a common phenomenon, that everybody was trying to find out about a woman that they didn't know. And we were all about half crazy, and everybody reports some degree of obsession. So to understand that, I did a survey on Facebook about two years ago now to ask people what had happened to them as a result of watching Gentleman Jack. Hmm. I had 600 responses oh. in two weeks. Oh, my gosh. And 100% of the lesbians who participated said that this would permanently change them. And I thought, something is going on here. So it was my attempt to understand that, that I decided to make my pilgrimage to Halifax, to walk in Ann Lister's footsteps, and then I began to understand that this was bigger than any of us thought, and that prompted the book. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, were you surprised at the number of people that responded to yes, you? Yes, I was shocked. I thought I would be lucky if 100 people answered. But when it was in the hundreds, and it wasn't just yes, no, you know, multiple guess, it was a lot of open-ended questions where people began to pour their hearts out. Oh they began to talk about coming out stories. They began to talk about family rejection. I was shocked at how many people had been physically abused mm -hmm. for the way they looked. And so then I thought, something big is happening in this community because for the first time we're being validated and we have media representation that's positive. Right. I know you've spoken about you know, the movies were where the uh, gay woman always dies in the end. Always dead. Death by lesbian, right? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, to your point, yesterday you and I were standing out in the, um, 
at the Peace Hall. And Pam Metcalf came up to us and started talking about how when she was, she had come out, she was in a gay pride parade someplace here in the UK, and people were heckling her for how she looked, what she was doing, walking along holding her girlfriend's hand. And she told such an amazing story yesterday about walking over to this one, there were a group of evangelical Christians. She walked over to the group, she took the Bible out of this guy's hand, and she said, so you, can I point out a few things to you? She opened up the Bible and she started pointing and said, Love, 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 love. Is that what you're doing here today? And I just thought that was one of the most amazing stories. To just, you know, it was yet another one of those moments for you and I, right. where when we talk to people, it's just always something that just blows you out of the water, right? The other thing that we're seeing is gratitude. Mm -hmm. People are so grateful for the recognition. They're so grateful to be with people who are it's our people. It's our tribe. It's our people. And uh, we haven't really had that. And to have it on a global scale is amazing. Yeah. And it happened overnight. Right. Right. Exactly. And just to, to add in on that, something that we talked about the other day, that Ann Lister had a community here in Halifax. She had friends and she had family, etc. But she never had affirmation. Correct. She didn't have people that she could just sit down with, relax, laugh about being gay, all of that. And that's what we are afforded. Yeah. yeah. And what was really nice yesterday is we're meeting people that we've seen online for the last couple yeah. of years, and everybody has this enormous connection. You're walking up and hugging complete strangers, yeah. and it feels like you've always known them. Yes, absolutely. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the stories that you took, but I do have a question. At any time, did you think about including any of the production people from general, anything like that? You know, Pat, originally that was my idea. I thought, what would it be like to work on a production like this? But as I started thinking about it, and after coming to Halifax, I thought, no, I really want to talk to fans. And I had a, so a little bit of pushback from my research director, and she mm -hmm. said, well, it's biased. And I said, yeah, it is biased, because uh, I want to talk to people who've been affected, not people ha who have not, right. because I was trying to understand why. I knew that people were claiming that things had changed, but I wanted to know how, and I wanted to get some idea of why. Because I think we've all struggled to kind of put our fingers on, why has this made such a difference? Right, right, right. So once you had, you, you'd gotten the questionnaires back, and you'd gone through all the answers, et cetera, did you go through a selection process, or was it just a question of who would actually then talk to you further? It, it wasn't scientific. One of the questions that I asked in this uh, questionnaire that was on Facebook was, would you be willing to talk to me about your experience being a lesbian? And I had, of the 500 or 600 or so, I would say half were willing to talk. Mm. And then when I posted some of the results on Facebook, I said, if you'd like to share your story, please get in touch with me. So I had this pool to pull from. Mm -hmm. And so the people that I talked to would often say, uh, well, I think you should talk to so-and-so in Italy. Or, you know, there's this woman in Kenya. Or, you know, I ran into somebody from the UK. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I'm American, but now I'm friends with somebody in the Philippines. So that was the beginning of the community. And one sort of led to another. And then the other thing is, since we're connected by social media now, there were lots of pretty interesting posts on uh, social media that I wanted to follow up on, so I would contact those people directly. And then the other thing I wanted to make sure I included was the response of people in Halifax, Anne's hometown. Mm. What is it like to live here with this new influx of visitors? How has it made any difference in their lives, or has it? Mm. And what are their feelings about Ann Lister? So mm. I think I talked to 15 or 16 people who are based right here in Halifax. Oh, wow. Interesting. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, was there a general consensus amongst people? Did they feel more welcome in Halifax? Are they, was there any change at all? Do you have any? The people that I talked to from Halifax were a bit amazed at the uh, response, wow. the influx of visitors, yeah. but everybody feels an enormous sense of pride yeah. about having you know, their favorite daughter getting the kind of recognition she's, she's probably never had right. in the last almost 200 years. Well, especially when we couldn't find her. <laughs> Um, so, what, when going through the questionnaires, what, was there anything in particularly that, in particular, in particular, that struck you about the responses? What struck me was the extent of the changes and the transformation. People were wanting to acknowledge who they were. 
They were determined to live authentically. They didn't want to have to hide anymore. There was this growing sense of pride. There was sort of like this puffing up your chest mm -hmm. a little bit, like, you know, and really, I guess the thread was, oh, it's okay to be gay. Right, right, right. And so that, that began to be pretty obvious. And then the other thing was this constant reference to community. You know, I now know people all over the world. Right. It's not just me. And you know, when you first recognize what your feelings are, at least 50 years ago, you thought you were the only one on the planet who ever felt this way. And I think especially around the world, in small communities, countries all over, I talked to people in 16 countries, wow. there is an isolation that if you're in a small village, you have to be really careful. And I talked to a woman in Serbia, for example, who said she wanted to come out. It wasn't that she was afraid something would happen to her, but she was very concerned about the impact it might have on her parents. Yeah. And she didn't want the community to treat her parents as if they had done, done something wrong to, to raise a queer daughter. Right, yeah, that old thing, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we had a little, uh, we had a little example of that transformational effect of the community, well actually a few of them, this weekend with everybody in town for the unveiling of the statue. And I don't want to mention names because I do realize that some people may not feel good about having this on tape, but there was one young woman who was here this weekend who had been suffering from a, some really difficult emotional ups and downs. Yeah. And she just, she posted the most amazing post on Facebook last night after she did. she'd gotten home. It was she, just, she had gone yeah. through some personal problems and she was feeling pretty worthless and pretty alone. And she was kind of really wandering around Halifax. And all of a sudden here are all these other lesbians who just open their arms, bring her in. She's an artist and you know, they're complimenting her on her work. And it was just that support. And I think that is really, if anything, is left behind when this series is long gone. It will be those connections and that sense of community because people, when, when you talk about community, it means the reduction of isolation. Oh, well and put. How would we have managed through the pandemic had we not had each other to uh, fill time with? So many people don't have partners and here they were locked into their houses with nowhere to go, nobody to talk to, and social media was a lifesaver. Right. During the pandemic, for sure. Absolutely. You know, and I can certainly tell you from an Aunt Lister Birthday Week perspective, it's been really something because it's actually given us more time to connect with people and, you know, really help foster that sense of community that you talk about. Well, it was an absolute bonanza for me because when you're caught, when a complete stranger is contacting you out of the blue and saying, would you like to talk to me about what it's like to be a lesbian? <laughs> That's not an easy answer right away. And people right. were going, yes, I'd be happy to talk to you. Right. And I tried to limit the interviews to an hour. That never worked out. It was hour and a half, two hours, three hours, multiple calls. Right. So it was delightful to meet so many great people. So tell us a little bit, if you, if you wouldn't mind sharing maybe two or three different stories that could give our viewers a feel for what you heard. So I had this combination of transcripts and interviews from 62 people. And I thought, what am I going to do with this? This is so much information. So I began to kind of catalog what people said. So there were the adventure seekers. There were the people who decided they would climb a mountain just because Ann Lister did. Mm -hmm. So it was nice to put them in a group. There was also a woman who uh, truly is an adventure seeker. Her dog had died and she was heartbroken and she needed something to fill the time. So she thought, I'll just repeat the trip that Ann Lister made to Copenhagen after things went south with Ann Walker. Okay. So she, instead of getting in a carriage, she gets in her Audi 7000. <laughs> Within the first 30 kilometers, she gets a speeding ticket, and she repeats Ann's journey. And I thought, how interesting, and I talked to her about that, and it turns out it wasn't just that one trip, it was 80 trips that she oh. took in Ann Lister's footsteps. Oh my so gosh. certainly thought she qualified to be an adventure seeker. And she said what had permanently changed her is she said, I will never go anywhere that I don't see it through Ann Lister's eyes. Wow, what a wonderful thing. So, so that was this group of people. Then there were the local people, the Halifax people who could talk about 
what it was like to just have Shibden Hall in their backyard. Mm. That I talked to an artist who'd been going there since he was a little boy. He had taken his own children there. So that was really touching. So that was the Halifax group. Then there were the Code Breakers, who are an astonishing mm. bunch of people who Absolutely. have plowed through these diaries for months and months and months. And they were interesting because they feel this really strong personal connection to Anne because they've been in her head. And they have read so much of her work that they know when she's having a bad day and they know what she's going to stay. <laughs> and so they were an interesting group. Yeah. Then there were the in search of Ann Walker people who want to make sure that Ann isn't a footnote in history. Right. Yeah. Then there were the people who became artists or who expressed themselves in other ways. Yeah. And then there were the people who were totally transformed to being more confident, having more courage. That's where the coming out stories are. That's the story of the 65-year-old local preacher who had been in the military, who knew better than to admit her sexuality or she would have been uh, dishonorably discharged. Oh, so yeah. lots of those kinds of things and the thread through every single one of those. And if I heard it once, I heard it, you know, more than 50 times. You know, if Ann Lister could be the way she was 200 years ago, I can certainly be that way now. Isn't that the case? Because it certainly is different coming out now than it was Oh, say 50 years ago or so, right? Yeah, wasn't that fun. Yeah. <laughs> a thrill ride. So you didn't originally have your own story in the book, right? No, I didn't think it was a story about me. I always considered it a story of, re of remarkable people who were even more remarkable for having been influenced by this television show. And I had a lot of people say, that isn't fair. You know, if mm. we told you our story, you have to tell us yours. And so very reluctantly, I did. Yes, exactly. Well, and the, you know, the interesting thing is, is, as you were talking about the people who have been transformed, I know two women that one was transformed to write a book and the other one was transformed to put on an event. So I think we're in good company. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit more about some of the stories that you heard. There is a couple here in, in uh, the UK that are very butch presenting mm -hmm. and always have been and to this day get jeered at, okay. spit on, all of those kinds of things. And one of, one of those women said to me, you know, if there was a button that you could put on the back of your neck and you could push gay or straight, we would all probably go with straight just because it's easier. And she also talked about the loneliness that comes with a life where you're not part of the mainstream. Right. And that really touched me because she said they no longer feel isolated. And in fact, her quote was, we're just us. Right. And now we have a community that looks like us, thinks like us, and we're not alone anymore. And that really, really struck me. Right. From, from all around the world. And before we go on, I want to say to all those butch presenting women that are out there, we have been standing on your shoulders for a very long time. I can't say enough about how much I, I honor your courage and the way that you've lived your lives and the shit that you've taken, quite frankly. So let me just say thank you, thank you for the entire community. Absolutely. Right? And I talk, I, another story that sticks out was I talked to a woman who's in her 60s now, and she's one of 13 children, and she always knew she wasn't like her sisters. She didn't want dolls. She wanted to play with guns and her brothers because they got to do more fun things. <laughs> And so, me. <laughs> so she, she, she thought the only way that she would fit in was to get married. So she married when she was 19 or 20, and she came out later, and she feels this enormous sense of grief and regret for having lost those years. And she said to me, you know, wouldn't it have been wonderful if my mother had said, you know, there was a little girl many, many years ago, and she was just like you. And, you know, and she turned out to be a really wonderful, strong woman. And she said to me, what would my life have been like if I had been given that kind of support? Yeah. And those kinds of things are really valuable. We, we, we forget what difference life would have been like if we had had that kind of support. Or if we'd had a television show like Gentleman Jack when we were teenagers or in our early 20s, we would have approached our lives much, much differently. Oh, absolutely. I remember a, a really good friend of mine in college when I had first gotten involved in gay liberation was talking about the fact that her mother had known from the, you know, she had told her mother from the moment that she had felt anything. And her mother just, you know, grabbed her and hugged her and said, I don't care who you are or what you do, I love you 
just as you are, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it really does make a difference. It makes a huge difference. Yeah, it does. I'll tell you a funny story about when I was in high school. I didn't really know what I felt. I just felt I wasn't like anybody else. Right. And my best friend and I were in the drama club. And so she was talking to her mother one day, and her mother said, you know, I think your friend is a lesbian. And my friend looked at her and said, oh, mother, don't be silly. You have the word wrong. We're thespians. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> so uh, I think her mother knew before I did. Yeah, probably. Uh, let me see. So we've talked about the mountain climbers. Um, you have a couple of other people. The, uh, the two, oh, those are the two women from Essex that we just talked about. Yeah. Right. And we're not using any names this morning for privacy's sake, but uh, they are in the book. Um, Let's see, having been hit by the gentleman jack effect, people are now feeling that they can be bold, Absolutely. they can be risk takers, they can do things like publish a book, write a book, write a book, go to Halifax, sit in front of a bunch of people, be congratulated for said book. Yeah, it's been awesome. It's been awesome. It's been an yeah. awesome weekend. And um, I just want to say, Janet, uh, being a, a published author myself, I know what it takes to go through this process. I need to congratulate you for Thank the amount you. of time and energy you put into this, because it's no small thing. No, it isn't. And there were many times when I had to end Lister up. <laughs> well you know, said. really, I think had I not made commitments to the people who talked to me to publish their stories, there were a couple of times along the way I thought, I'm too little. I cannot do this. And then I thought, oh, pull up your big girl panties and get on with it. <laughs> so you did have your Ann Lister moment. Many times. In fact, I kept a postcard of Ann Lister on my desk so that I would have a constant reminder to uh, take a chance. I mean, I didn't know if it would be successful or not. And, and I still don't have the assurance that it will be. But the point is, what I'm really excited about is that I got to be the voice for a lot of people who otherwise would not have told their story. Absolutely. And I think it's really important that people claim who they are and be acknowledged for being brave to talk to a stranger and lay them, themselves out for scrutiny. And the response from them has been pretty amazing because they, they seem to all feel a sense of pride. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time this morning, and we'll be picking up. You, you'll have your chance to ask, uh, uh, do the Q&A with uh, Janet live here in just a minute, because as you know, you're seeing this on Saturday. So, but in the meantime, Janet, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, and, and I just want to say something else, Pat. You're so kind about giving everybody else credit, but I think we owe you a great deal. The fact that you have done these interviews now for almost two years and that you're bringing together this global community is also no small thing. So, you know. It's very kind of you to say that. It is, um, I get a tremendous amount of pleasure out of it. And I feel as if I have found the capper to my life's work. So I'm, I'm good with it. Way to go. Yeah. And we're back. Hey, Janet. Here we was are. That fun? It I was fun. Got that conversation. That was awesome. It was. It really worked out well. It was. Um, I, I'm surprised that it worked out as well as it did. <laughs> we had to, as you can see, we were using two cameras, and we discovered, you know, later on that one was in autofocus and was jumping back and forth. <laughs> and we we really just handed Steph a pile of stuff and said. Make this work, please. So there we are. Um, we have a couple. We have a few questions coming in. Um, this one is from Joanne Bartone. Did you discover a central theme to the stories you heard once you review once you reviewed them? And if so, what was that theme? No, I, I don't think there was a central theme. I think there was a thread. The thread was more community than anything else, and there was also a sense of. I think being grateful that somebody cared enough to ask what life was like for them, how a gentleman Jack made a difference because that gave them a chance to talk about the changes that they had undergone. So if there, if there was a thread, it was community and it also was about change and transformation. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, this is from Sam Johnson. Did you find that most people you spoke to were lesbians? Did you speak to others from the LGBTQ plus community? 
You know, when I started, Pat, I thought this would be a book that only lesbians would uh, respond to. And I was quickly disproved of that. You know, I've said many times, one of the prerequisites for being a lesbian is you have to be a woman first. So I found this woman, this book has a lot of appeal to women in general. I didn't go looking for people who weren't lesbian. I went looking for people who were willing to talk to me. Some self-identified as non-binary. I didn't talk to anybody who was trans, but I talked to a lot of straight women as well who, uh, who just appreciate the fact that Anne was such a strong woman. And I think as women, we've all experienced a fair amount of garbage as a result of just being female. And so Anne is an example to anybody who needs to, a little boost, a little reminder to, to have some courage. You know, she may have said to Anne Walker, have some courage, but in a lot of ways, she's telling us the very same thing. Boy, for all the times that we've done this with me sitting in this little corner, that's the first time a fire truck has gone by, even though the fire station's right down the street. So apologies. Um, okay, let's see. From Christine Santos. Did you feel nervous in translating the spoken word experiences of others into your own written words? That well, was quite a project well, for you. Hey, Christine, thanks for the question. Chris is actually an incredibly interesting young woman, and I want to tell you a little bit about her story. She is Portuguese. She lives in Brasilia. And uh, when she saw Gentleman Jack, she wanted to know more about Ann Lister and discovered there was nothing in Portuguese available. So mm -hmm. she took it upon herself to write it. An, an art book. She's also a, an artist about Ann Lister. So it was really fantastic talking to someone like Chris who explained to me this whole process. So I found when I was talking to people that I looked for kernels in their stories that I thought other people would find interesting and wove them into our conversation. And uh, she's a perfect example, a young woman working on her uh, master's degree using a television show as the basis for her thesis. So um, thanks for the question, Chris, and thanks for the interview. It was, it's great. Uh, let's see here. This is from Leslie Brown. Will there be a second book? Only if all of you go out and buy about 100 copies of the first one. <laughs> Got to make it worthwhile. Yeah. No, no, seriously, yeah. people have asked me that. And I think what I'm going to do in as I think about whether there is an, an opportunity for a second book, I'm going to on my website, JanetLee.com, uh, update the current stories and probably start adding some new ones. You know, I talked to 62 people. I could have talked to 62,000 people. So there are so many more stories to be told. So depending on the success of the first book, there could be a sequel. That's, I, I'm, I'm actually really glad to hear that because as you say, Janet, we have, we have thousands of stories out there. And sometimes it's just a question of the person finding the right outlet or even knowing that it's available for somebody to mm -hmm. talk to. You know, we yeah. make a lot of assumptions. And mm -hmm. I, I think we make a lot of assumptions out of our own experiences of being gay women and members of the LGBTQ plus community because we, you know, we come up out of our lives of our first experience about understanding that we may be different from one another, that we may be that oddity that Ann Lister talks about. And that sometimes gets in our way in terms of going out to find relief, conversation, friends, any number of things. It kind of sets us back a square. So yeah, what, the other thing what, is, what I'm thankful for about Gentleman Jack, by the way. Well, I, you know, I think that in a lot of ways, we are more similar than we are different. Mm -hmm. And in talking to so many people, that's, that's something that I did discover that we all have unique experiences, but as gay women, we're all connected by the fact that we are gay women. And um, it's just important to provide support for, for all of us in this community. You know, you mentioned earlier about the young women in Halifax. And I think one of the things that I've observed in social media and in all the contacts we've all made is that it's sometimes hard to, to live authentically. But when you have the support of a community, as I think we all do now, it just makes it a whole lot easier. So I, I think that if we can, you know, stay connected 
it will enhance the experience of life for everybody. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, this is from uh, Lisa Joa. Which interview surprised you the most? That's a really fantastic question. I'm my little mind is kind of going down the list of all the people that I talk to. Um, That's a lot of people you have to be skimming through right now. You want me to vamp for a little while while you're thinking? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really don't know. I mean, I'd have to think about it. And I will. And, you and, will. I'll, and I'll post it in my blog. Oh, that's a really great idea. Yeah, it might make a really good conversation to sort of start in there, don't you think? Yeah, I think so. This is from Ariane, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it uh, correctly, Loki. When did you first hear about Ann Lister and what effect has she had on your own life? You know, until I saw Gentleman Jack, I had never heard of Ann Lister. And I remember after watching the first episode, looking at my wife and saying, was that a real person? And she said, yes, this show is based on her diaries. That was my very first um, indication that such a woman existed. And uh, I think the effect that all of this has had on my life is it's got me a lot more interested in 19th century history, for one thing. Uh, it's it's gotten me to England twice. And yeah. uh, it's introduced me to a global community that I never knew even existed. Yeah. And a, and a really amazing one. Um if I can take a second to answer that question as well, um, I had never heard of Ann Lister until I turned on Gentleman Jack, and I didn't actually know that she was a real person until I was about, I don't know, I was certainly through the first episode. Um, and it was astounding to me to find that this person who had accomplished so much, especially with the diaries, was so hidden. And yet at the same time, it didn't astound me at all. And I yeah. think that that's, that was my jumping off point of wanting to find out more about her. You know, I often describe myself to people as someone who certainly enjoyed Gentleman Jack and cannot thank Sally Wainwright and Saran Jones enough for what they've done with that. And of course, Sophie Rundle, for all you Sophie Rundle fans out there. And, um, but at the same time, it's just been, you know, the and part of it is really the part that fascinates me more than anything else, yeah. right? Yeah, well, uh, what's interesting about that, Pat, also is that we we kind of have parallel tracks running here. We have our interest in the real Ann Lister, and we have our fandom for Saran Jones. Mm -hmm. And those things weave in and out all the time. So, you know, even if you don't know much about the real Ann Lister, you know enough from the television series itself, even parts that are fictionalized, to have a pretty good sense of a woman who was different, brave, you know, inspirational, all of that kind of thing. So I just find it interesting sometimes that, you know, we gravitate back and forth. Some days we're true Ann Lister fans, and some days we're true Sarah Ann Jones fans, and some days we're both. Yeah, and let me just say that on... Um... On Sunday of this past weekend, I think all of us were over the moon about both Sally and Saran because their generosity at that unveiling was phenomenal. They, um, once they had finished actually unveiling the statue, then the, all of the stuff that you would imagine would happen. There were people filming um, for the BBC, et cetera, and all sorts of stuff was going on. And then this group kind of split up and people wandered away and the rope lines came down and all the rest of that. But guess what? Guess who was still standing out there talking to people? Saran oh. Jones and Sally Wainwright. And for a really long time. That for was a really long time. time. I'd actually gone over to have uh, a bite to eat and something to drink when Saran came back in and was doing all the rest of the, you know, the conversations with people. So I was just really, really stunned. Uh, and how absolutely wonderful they both are about that. It's really, yeah. um, it, it really is special. And, they, and it means a lot to both of them, even though they certainly hadn't been prepared for this. Well, so, what made me particularly happy was watching Saran Jones autograph my book because that was what people had in their hands. So they had something for her to sign. So that was a special thrill. That is a very special thrill. So um, let's see, this is from Jane Kendall. 
What are your thoughts about the importance of your book? Several people have asked me that question, Pat. And, and, you know, I think I'm a little bit surprised at the response that the book has gotten. I've been told that one of the things that will make it valuable in the short and long term is that it's a record of uh, lesbian history at this point in time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't set out for it to be that, but I think that is actually, in fact, what's happening. So what I hope that it will do for people who read it is to be reminded of how remarkable they are. As I said, this is this is a book about remarkable people doing remarkable things. And I found in talking to such a diverse group of people that everybody has something special. And I think that we don't always recognize that in ourselves. So I'm hoping as people read this and they read the stories of other people, they recognize that their story is every bit as interesting and every bit as valuable to someone else who might hear it. It's it's 2021 and it's still not easy to be a lesbian. Yeah. Yeah. It's still not easy to come to terms with your feelings. If you're non-binary, if you're trans, whatever you are, the challenge of living authentically is still with us and probably always will be. So if my book can contribute anything to making that easier for somebody, I will feel that it was successful. Yeah. And that's, that is a, a fantastic answer because it really is the truth. Anything that, that can be added to the conversation for people to understand that they aren't alone, that their story really isn't that much different from anyone else's, even though it may be as horrible as you could possibly be. There's another one out there. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's just really such a benefit to know that there is a community that's out there and that, that, and that the fact that it's worldwide is really so important because it's easy enough to have these conversations in the United States or in the UK, but then when you move into places like Singapore or, or India or Kenya or any of the places that people are appearing out of, it's just it's just wonderful. You know, I can't yeah. say enough about it. Um, and this is from the wonderful Kirsty Davies, the ambassador of Halifax. Kirsty is asking, where in Halifax did you feel the greatest connection to Anne? For me, the connection I feel strongly, strongest to Anne is at Shibden Hall. There's there's something about that house that is just, it's comfortable, it's not grand. It, the grounds are exquisitely beautiful. And I, that's where I feel, Anne. I know a lot of people feel her presence more in the Halifax Minster, but for me, it, it's Shibden Hall. You know, I just, there's something about just walking through that house. And what struck me initially, the very first time I was in the house was seeing all the improvements that Anne had made uh, with Anne Walker's money. And right. holding on to the banister going up to the second floor and realizing that she had probably had that design and shaped to fit a woman's hand. Yeah. It is very small and it's very comfortable. And I just remember smiling, thinking, oh, Anne, you didn't miss a trick. No, she didn't miss a detail, did she? No, I don't think so. Yeah. I think that, you know, for me, it's a combination of the two. It's like I feel two different sides of Anne Lister uh, mm -hmm. in, those, in those two places. And, uh, it, it especially because we've been doing so much work on trying to find her in the minster. You know? So it's, um, that's a big deal. Well, uh, also, Pat, there's something about when you're sitting in the church in the minster, yeah. you can sit in Anne's pew if you want to, you know, she took communion at, at, at that high altar, you know, she replicated the rails on the communion rail in her home. Yeah. I mean, you know that she was baptized in that font at the back of the church. I mean, she's all over the place. Yeah. So it's easy to feel a connection to her there. And I think a lot of people do. Yeah, it's really, it's really wonderful. Um, a couple, a couple more things. Um, which interview was from the farthest point out? Um, probably distance wise for me, it's kind of a toss up between Singapore, the Philippines, uh, New Zealand, Australia, those are, you know, nine, 10,000 miles away from where I live in New Mexico. But I, I tried to just talk to as many people as possible. I wanted to talk to someone from every continent, but I really didn't know how to get in touch with lesbians in Antarctica. So if anybody's yeah. listening, 
you know, call me. Right. Email me. If anybody's at one of the like the polar stations up there watching this now. No, I, I actually checked into all the stations and I thought there has to be a station manager that I could email. But in the end, I thought, OK, this is going to take way too much time. But I did think about it. <laughs> That's great. And then uh, uh, the last question I want to ask you is where can people get the book? What a wonderful question. And thank you for asking. <laughs> Uh, right now, the book is available uh, from Amazon and from a lot of other ebook retailers. It should be available in independent bookstores, I'd say, by about mid October. Oh, fantastic. And then, um, meanwhile, back in Halifax at ALBW 2022, you'll be signing the book there, correct? Yes. And um, the, the corner bookstore is going to be carrying the book all the time. So anybody, anybody visiting Halifax can pop in and uh, not only buy my book, but the assortment of other Anlister related books that they have. They have an enormous section. So, you know, if you haven't been able to find the books elsewhere, you will find them at the book corner. Right. And you'll be able to get them signed by um, Janet. You'll be able to get it signed by Jill Liddington. Um, God willing that everybody makes it through. You're going to get them signed by Helena Whitbread. So, you know, I, and Patricia Hughes is coming in. So if you have a Patricia Hughes book, um, please bring it along. Um, and I think that that's going to wrap it up for today, Janet, unless do you have anything else that you want to say about uh, the book? What I'd like to, I would really like to thank all the people who uh, participated and, and spent so much time and told me their stories. You know, the book wouldn't exist if I hadn't had your, your help and your cooperation. I'd especially like to thank uh, my illustrator and editor, Vivian Swift, who's, who was just fantastic to work with and her illustrations really enhanced the book. And I really want to thank my wife. She's, she's been incredibly patient and supportive for these last couple of years. And, you know, it's probably the biz biggest ask I've made of her in the 40 years we've been together. So, you know, Mary Lou Mitchell is a saint. Mm, wonderful. Wonderful. Well, and Janet. Thank you, thank you, Pat, for the interview. It's it's It was a delight to spend all that time with you in Halifax. And it's a real treat to be on ALBW Live. So thanks. My pleasure, Janet. And uh, we'll see you at the next ALBW meeting. No kidding. <laughs> right. See you so later. on. All right, stick around for a couple of announcements here, as usual. And um, what I was just referring to, by the way, Janet Lee is a part of our ALBW team and was uh, in Halifax, obviously, for the book launch, but also because we spent that uh, weekend, or that week, excuse me, running all over Halifax. You're going to see the results of that over the next few months. But a couple of things that I want to announce uh, along the way, first of all, coming up very soon, we have the Ann Lister Summit, and there it is, the Ann Lister Research Summit. Uh, there was one of these that was done previously, big success, and now we're going to be doing the second one. Um, do check that out because they have a number of different, uh, really interesting workshops going. I was looking at the uh, looking at the events this morning, um, so please do check that out. Uh, second of all, for all of you, those of you who have been asking. Um, we will be launching the events for ALBW at the end of this month, October. So we are in the month that you're finally going to find out what we're doing over there. And then we will be launching ticket sales uh, later on in November. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, um, if you qualify for what we call our VIP list, and make let me make that very clear, uh, we refer to VIPs as those of you who purchased tickets for the event that was supposed to be held in 2022 and, of course, had to be canceled. So we have set, we have all your email addresses. We have sent emails to you asking you if you are going to be coming to the event. And if so, we want to make sure that we have your name on that VIP list because you will get uh, the, you'll have the opportunity to buy your tickets before anybody else does, just as a gigantic thank you to not only the fact that you bought for the first event, but for your patience in waiting for the second one. Um, not to worry, the rest of you, we have plenty going on. You'll be able to get tickets. And um, so, uh, so please look for that. I'm sorry, needed to go back to this idea about the uh, VIPs. Please, if you don't think that you've been contacted, by Cheryl McDonald about your VIP status, please check your junk mail 
or whatever it is that captures stuff in there, um, because that's probably where you're going to find it and get back to us as soon as possible, if you possibly can. Um, that's, uh, those are the announcements for now. Um, I certainly want to thank my team as always. I want to thank my ALBW event team who was with me in Halifax, uh, Cheryl McDonald, Jennifer Grant, Janet Pellegrino, Janet Lee, and then of course from uh, our connection to Calderdale and Halifax, Rachel Lappin, who's been an, an outstanding uh, assistant for getting us connected with all the right people. And uh, let's see. I know there was something else. I know I'm going to forget it. Okay, so uh, thanks again. Upcoming ALBWs, we have a number of people we're going to be interviewing. You'll see announcements for that coming up shortly as soon as Steph gives me her available dates because that's how this operates. We can only do it when Steph's here So, because she's that important. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please stay safe. Can't find my Ann Lister mask, so I'm using this one this morning. Wear your mask. Be careful. Get the jab, please. It's looking really, really good the way things are shaping up. We're seven months out still from the event, and we're feeling really, really positive about the fact that it's going to go. So thanks again. This is Pat Eskate signing off, and I'll see you in Halifax.